I would like to thank the organizing committee for giving us the opportunity to present our research. We have no relevant disclosures. In Australia, 5% of first vagina deliveries are complicated by obstetric and sphincter injuries. It's the most common cause of anal incontinence in women of reproductive age and can be associated with medical legal implications related to missed and inaccurate diagnosis or to persistent sphincter defects and incontinence symptoms even after primary repair. Accurate diagnosis and appropriate management of sphincter injuries is crucial to prevent anal incontinence. Endoanal ultrasound is considered the gold standard when assessing the obstetric anal sphincter complex and correlates with symptoms of anal incontinence. External and internal anal sphincter anatomy is assessed at the upper, mid and lower anal canal. Residual anal sphincter defects can be recorded by determining the Stark score, which is a series of measurements that determine the extent of a defect in the external and internal anal sphincters, as well as the anal mucosa. Due to its relative intrusiveness, other ultrasound modalities, such as transperineal ultrasound with a convex 4D probe, have been explored. Using tomographic ultrasound imaging, a set of eight slices is obtained, and the central six slices are evaluated for sphincter abnormalities. Transperineal ultrasound has demonstrated high interrate reliability for diagnosis of external anal sphincter defects. Rating of OAC can be performed by the algorithm developed by Dietz et al. Where a 3A tear is diagnosed on tomographic imaging, if less than 4 F6 slices are abnormal at the external anal sphincter and a 3C or 4 degree tear if both the external anal sphincter and the internal anal sphincter were abnormal in more than 4 out of 6 slices. A defect of more than 30 degrees after primary repair, as demonstrated in the picture on the right, is considered significant. A residual defect is diagnosed if a significant defect in 4 out of 6 slices from slices 2 to 7 is noted, as demonstrated in the picture on the left. Both the grade of the tear as well as residual defects in the external anal sphincter have shown a strong correlation with anal incontinence. The aim of our study was to evaluate the agreement between 3D and anal ultrasound and 3D 4D transperineal ultrasound in assessing anal sphincter defects in women after primary repair of OAC. This was a prospective cohort study of primary repairs women referred to a perineal clinic after primary repair of OAC. Clinical grading was performed according to the classification described by Sultan. Patients completed a validated SITMARS questionnaire and underwent clinical exam including endoanal and transperineal ultrasounds. Prior to ultrasound analysis, a test retest series was carried out to evaluate inter-observer agreement for detection of anal sphincter defects on both modalities. Assessment of ultrasound images was performed blinded to all other findings. Weighted kappa was used to evaluate agreement between clinical, endoanal and transperineal ultrasound diagnosis of OAC. 52 primary press women were approached after primary repair of OAC during the inclusion period. 31 consented to participate in our study, 4 were excluded due to missing data. 27 data sets were analyzed at a medium follow-up of 6 months. One patient who was rated as a 3A tear clinically was found to have normal anal sphincter anatomy on both ultrasound modalities. Another relevant constatation was that transperineal ultrasounds could not discriminate between 3C and 4 degree tears, while endoanal ultrasound could. Full agreement between clinical and transperineal ultrasounds, between clinical and endoanal ultrasounds, and between both endoanal and transperineal based grading of OAC was noted in approximately 70% of women with a weighted kappa of 0.6. 
Overall, there was no disagreement by two or more categories between both ultrasound-based screening techniques and clinical assessments. The association between symptoms of anal incontinence and transperineal ultrasound or endoanal ultrasound grading did not reach statistical significance at a medium follow-up of six months. Neither was there a significant correlation between residual defects on endoanal ultrasound and transperineal ultrasound and the St. Mark's score at six months follow-up. We found that both clinical and transperineal ultrasound-based grading of OAC on the one hand and endoanal ultrasound-based and transperineal ultrasound-based grading of OAC on the other hand demonstrated moderate agreement with a weighted kappa of 0.6. The association between symptoms of anal incontinence and ultrasound grading did not reach statistical significance. A possible explanation is the adequate OAC repair as 23 out of 27 patients had no residual defects. We also noted that the transperineal ultrasound could not discriminate between 3C and 4 degree tears, while endoanal ultrasound could. It is however unclear whether this is clinically relevant. Our study demonstrated that transperineal ultrasound provides a good alternative for grading OAC compared with gold standard endoanal ultrasounds. This is relevant as it is less invasive and more readily available. I thank you for your attention and look forward to your questions.